Hello again, everyone, and welcome to our new panel presentation. Uh, this will be moderated by none other than Bill Laboon, and we have some important guests today joining us on this particular panel. So we're going to be talking about identity, transparency, and privacy. Um, Tune from Litton Tree, Manta, uh, Kenny should be joining us from Manta, and then, of course, Dimitri from SubSquid. So welcome, everybody. Hey, yeah. happy to be here. Hey everyone. Yeah, uh, so I guess while we're waiting for uh, for Kenny, we can all just do a quick round of introductions for the people that are here. Uh, just you know who you are and what the, your project uh, is. So just for those of you that don't know me, I'm Bill Laboon. I'm head of education and grants at the Web3 Foundation. Uh, Eva? Um, Hi everyone, uh, I'm Dima. Uh, I'm co-founder and CEO of Subsquid. So uh, we at Subsquid make the data accessible. So uh, basically whenever you do analytics or build a, a UI for your app, uh, we're uh, here to help. Thanks, uh, Tun. Sweet. Hey everyone, I'm Tun, Director of Growth at Litentree. We're a decentralized identity aggregator and we mostly provide you with tools to truly start owning your Web2 and Web3 public data to manage it and to leverage it to um, yeah, engage with dApps in a more uh, customized way and uh, find perks and benefits that you can unlock with your identity data. Okay, thanks. And uh, Kenny? Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, my name is Kenny, and I'm one of the co-founders of Manta Network. And Manta Network specifically specializes in on-chain privacy using zero-knowledge proofs. Um, yeah. All right. Thanks. Uh, all right. So we, you know, you've seen you know, the, the title of the talk about identity, transparency, and privacy. So I guess the first thing I wanted to ask about, and I think people will be uh, curious about, is what exactly does it mean, you know, identity on chain? Is this different than having an identity in real life? Uh, you know, wh what are the differences uh, between what we normally think of as identity in the, in the off-chain world? So I'll, I'll throw that out there for whoever wants to, to start. Dima, you want to go? Uh, yeah, actually, I was um, thinking that you want to like jump in. As, I guess like Litten Tree is uh, uh, focusing on that. Um, but yeah, um, to me, uh, it is like a very a clear difference in delineation here because uh, our real identity is bound to the place where uh, we were born, and uh, this is something that, that has uh, no real indication of what we do in our life. Uh, some people hold passports that allow them to travel. Some people hold passports that are not that respected. Uh, you may or may not uh, like share the, the the rights of your country. So uh, I'm like uh, Russian, but I'm also hold a Swedish passport, and basically I'm lucky. Uh, but uh, some of my colleagues they like do not have this privilege. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's like a big difference uh, from identity in Web3, where basically uh, it is all only your activity uh, that identifies who exactly you are and uh, who you want to be perceived. And uh, I think this is like a real breakthrough in the way that we uh, organize ourselves as a society and assign certain uh, rights, uh, privileges, and also uh, uh, the way that we interact with each other, right? Without actually uh, relying on where we were born. That's kind of the way I see it. Yeah, and, and Tune, it looked like you also had some uh, something to say on this. Yeah, I think what uh, Dima is saying is a very good introduction to like what we at literally call the the government yeah, yeah. governmental identity or the federate identity, which is usually owned or controlled by one central one centralized party, usually a government or uh, one of the bigger tech monopolies. Um, it feels that the Web3 identity, the decentralized identity, the on-chain identity is indeed based on your achievements, your transactions, the interactions, all of the public data that is out there. Um, but for us, it's also very much um, an internet-ready identity, an identity with which you, you can unlock so many new features that you couldn't with the others, such as... Um, authorizing uh, credentials, uh, storing uh, assets, um, sharing sharing different um, 
uh, yeah, messages with each other in a decentralized way. Um, that's that's really what we are hoping to unlock also with uh, the decentralized identity. Okay, and uh, Kenny, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, yeah, sure. So I think that uh, Dima and Tune both touched on uh, various aspects of identity that define you know the differences between real life identity and on chain identity. Um, I think one other sort of difference, um, you know, going back to on-chain privacy is uh, the lack thereof currently, at least, for on-chain identity, right? In, in real life, you don't need to know my social security number, despite the fact that it's part of my identity. You don't need to know my birthday, despite the fact that it's part of my identity. You don't need to know what I'm wearing. I can close the door, right? But there's not really that equivalent on-chain. Um, basically, every action that you take is to you know, describe um is fully viewable by anyone with internet access right as long as they can are competent to go enough into a block explorer at least today right but with ai with analytic technologies tools right it's it's just a matter of time before it becomes accessible to anyone with or without some sort of technical knowledge um so i think like that's also one difference that uh frankly needs to be solved yeah yeah, so that um, actually brings up, uh, it's a good segue rather into like, you know, our, our next question. Um, so, you know, you mentioned, you know, there's been this, you know, the, a stereotype, right, of, of blockchain technology. It, you know, it's totally pseudon pseudonymous, totally anonymous, uh, which I think we all know, right, people that are involved in, in the blockchain industry, uh, that that's, that's not the case, uh, right? As you said, anyone with a blockchain explorer can look up your identity, get all sorts of information about what you, you have done on chain. And we've seen some instances of this happening in, in the past. So I guess the, the question is um, really, you know, what are then you know, the benefits of even you know, providing even more, you know, benefits and drawbacks of providing even more information you know, on chain, associating your identity even further? And is there anything we can do and I, I, I know, and I'm saying this sort of hypothetically because I know there are things we could do. I just like to, to discuss them, uh, you know, to help you know, save, you know, some of some of our privacy while still having an identity. So really, like two questions here, right? You know, what are the benefits and, and drawbacks of of having this identity on, on chain? And then, you know, are there any ways that we can you know, protect and sort of have both of them? So Kenny, do you want to continue? You were already uh, sort of halfway to the topic there. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, um, you know, one major benefit, I think, especially on chain. Um, thanks. Thanks, Carlos. I just saw that comment <laughs> pop up on screen. Uh, this is my bad hair. Um, so one major benefit here is um, same <laughs> I'm sorry, I got to stop looking at the comment section. <laughs> <laughs> the um, one major benefit here is that especially with on chain activity right now, at least in the short term, um, you see this proliferation of bots, right? Because um, I, not to name any names, but um, you know, a lot of other uh, networks and uh, apps that we're launching um, ZKSBTs for, which you know, I can get into that if um, time allows. But regardless, uh, the point being that all these networks, all these applications, they suffer from bots, right? Like uh, you see someone or you see a network all of a sudden have like five hundred thousand wallet addresses in one day, um, come on, like you're not kidding anyone, right? <laughs> so so the, the question now is like, you know, with, with Web3 growing as quickly as it should, um, you know, what's, what's the real usage of, um, you know, blockchain? And so being able to identify real users and, and real user behavior, real user activity, right? Like that's important, not just on the level of just measuring the market size, but also you know, product development. Um, who, are you getting feedback from bots? Or are you getting feedback from real people, right? Like there's a lot of implications around like on-chain identity that are really applied even today. And I think like even in the future, three to five years from now, right? With the proliferation of AI simultaneously as we're continuing to grow the Web3 space, um, you know, we, we're already seeing uh, use cases, both um, altruistic and nefarious and just, you know, fun. Uh, fun being, for example, the, the, the that one content creator who decided to create an AI version of herself and sell her AI voice for like seventy thousand dollars a week, right? Like uh, that's that's kind of a very novel example of something that could actually be used fairly nefariously. 
right? Um, we've also seen case studies where you have uh, simulated voices of, um, you know, children who call their parents and ask for certain information, right? How do you identify what's a real person and what's an AI? I think that's a, that's a use case for identity on chain that extends beyond just like on chain activities and very much applies to the real world where you're able to use decentralized self sovereign identity that only you control that can't really be accessed by any sort of centralized entity um, that allows you to prove your, you know, personhood, you're real, not, not a bot, not an AI. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are just like some, some sort of use cases. Um, and I think the second part of the question was more around, um, the privacy side. Uh, and so around privacy specifically, um, I think that, you know, the, the on-chain privacy people liken it to tornado cash and the, uh, issues around, you know, money laundering and all the, the bad behaviors. I think that the bad behaviors are really attributed to a lot of selective bias. Um, but you know, I, I won't go into detail right now, but you know, can talk about it later if needed. Um, but the point is that I think that if we, uh, have on-chain privacy, we're not really, um, asking for something so special. We're actually just trying to ask for what the traditional internet already delivers to users, right? When you use a bank account, you have to log in with your password. I can't see tunes bank account information. I can't see Dima's bank account information, right? Without stealing their identity. And that in its own case is against the law. Whereas on web three, all I need is their wallet address. And now I have is their complete financial history uh, on the blockchain, which is surprisingly from my perspective, a bit too transparent. <laughs> yeah, you know, it is, it, it is interesting, right? Because, you know, blockchain, if you look at the early days, especially of Bitcoin, we thought like, okay, everything is anonymous or pseudonymous, but it turns out, no, you actually are giving a lot more information than you, than you expected, perhaps. Um, so uh, let's go, maybe go in reverse order here. So uh, Toon, uh, so what would you say, like, you know, the, the positives and negatives of, having identity uh, on chain? Yeah, um, we have this good comparison with a company, like uh, using your one single blockchain address or one wallet address to log into every single dApp and, and experience is kind of like showing your complete bank statement when you're paying the cashier in the supermarket, right? You're, you're taking all of your transaction history and you just give it up for grabs. Um, so within the identity industry, and I'm, I'm sure, um, uh, Manta will also be very familiar with that. We we have this concept called selective disclosure. Um, we just give away the, the amount of information that we actually would like to give away or that is uh, relevant to this certain situation that I'm in. We're bringing our con contextual self. We're bringing our necessary self to the application. Um, so if I'm trying to log into a DeFi application, then I'll take uh, hopefully just the uh, uh, credentials or the amount of information that is that is relevant for that specific uh, DAP to, to provide me a customized experience like we're actually used to in Web2, but um, yeah, in, in Web3, we control our own data. Um, and then there's the technology that allow that, such as CK proofs and, and Litentree doesn't necessarily use that. We use uh, trusted execution enclaves, which is a, is a hardware-based solution um, to um, add this additional layer of privacy on top of, uh, of the blockchain, which I do think is, is necessary. Um, blockchains are amazing systems because they have this, yeah, there's some transparency, there's composability, immutability, um, but we do need that extra layer of uh, um, uh, privacy uh, added on top, on top of already kind of like a wallet hygiene that is quite necessary that everybody should be aware of that it, everybody should uh, uh, take in account. Um, so yeah, that's that's a bit that itself also um, tells the the downsides and upsides, right? We own our own data. We can take it anywhere. We can uh, migrate it anywhere. But that also means that we need to start actively manage our identity data. I think that's maybe the biggest shift between Web 2 and Web 3 in terms of identity data. It's from a, a passive um, management of our data to an active management of our data. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, Dima. Um, yeah, those are uh, like really great points. Uh, I can speak from the point of view of uh, data indexing and data collection that uh, what we basically are focusing on right now and I would say that um, user-centric indexing 
is something that is, I believe, going to be huge. Uh, and uh, this is going in line of uh, moving more and more uh, functionality to the uh, user applications. So instead of like having a kind of backend servers that serve the data, uh, we will see a lot more dApps that will have sort of an integrated wallet within. And uh, the indexing will also uh, collect the user-specific data from multiple sources. And this data uh, may be private and encrypted with the private keys uh, that are available only on uh, if you connect the specific wallet. So basically, from the uh, data perspective, uh, I see identity is somewhat like as a fuzzy concept. Basically, it's a, like a cloud of all the data that is attributable to a specific address. And um, we already have the uh, required technology that uh, allows uh, to shield this, <clears throat> this information from the outside world. Well, if you do have this private keys, this allows you to collect it from multiple sources and basically provide a very rich uh, experience from the end user, which may be, uh, and it is uh, very portable. So you can basically use this information across multiple chains and multiple uh, universes and multiple depths. Uh, so I think that this like technology also uh, relies on the way that you can efficiently fetch this data and uh, decode it client side. Okay, um, so I see we have a bit less than five minutes left. Uh, so just um, you know, sort sort of briefly, and this really uh, bring uh, uh, goes off of what uh, Tun had said earlier that like you. Know, you really need to have like an active role now in thinking about privacy when you're dealing with with blockchains. Um, so maybe you know uh, maybe we we'll start with with Tune since you brought it up. Like, what are some of these considerations that you should make and some of the trade offs that uh, you know to, to actively manage uh, your, your identity? Yeah, in our uh, in the infrastructure that we apply to add that layer of privacy, as I mentioned before, wallet hygiene, um, just making sure that you keep certain wallets uh, compartmentalized, you don't mix them all up, maybe some are for your cold storage or whatever you want to do, and, and some are really your hot wallets, you go out, you make them, you get them dirty, <laughs> so to say, um, I think that's a um, uh, a good one and then pick pick a system that allows you to manage your identity pick a tool pick um one of the uh, emerging identity providers or identity identity tooling providers to go and play with them um explore the different opportunities that are out there people are talking about soulbound tokens people are talking about nfts as data containers we personally are fans uh, of uh, verifiable credentials and decentralized identifiers um that's all very related to self-sovereign identity, uh, something that most of us are a fan of. Um, go explore that, educate it, uh, educate yourself on, on how those technologies work. Um, and also know that, well, that's at least my personal opinion. I think it's still pretty early uh, for decentralized identity. I see so many cool innovations and, and projects pop up and um, the problem right now is we're at this stage where all the protocols are still very visible and still need to be uh, abstracted away, need to be implemented, such as Dima said. Uh, like we want, we a, a good comparison is like when we send an email, we're no longer thinking on whether we're uh, using IPOP or IMAP. It's just part of our Gmail experience. And that's what should happen with decentralized identity as well. So it's pretty early if you're interested in in it, go explore, go see what's out there, and um, there will most likely also be some uh, some opportunities for the early adopters. Yeah, thank you, and I, yeah, I know that's a good uh, 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 reminder. I know that uh, you know my bill uh, identity on Kusama is definitely very dirty, and lots of people uh, have have seen it, and I've done a lot of stuff there. Uh, so, uh, Kenny, would you like to go next? What you know, what trade offs do you think people should be aware of, and you know, and how they should actively manage their identity on chain? Yeah. So um, there's um, so in terms of trade offs, trade offs specifically, um, I see there's two sort of camps of how people are managing their on chain identity these days. Uh, the first camp is uh, multiple wallet addresses. So people tend to think that they can 
uh, create a new wallet address for different types of identity, maybe holding certain NFTs in one other than others, some crypto in this one, some meme coins in that one, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so the, the trade-off here is essentially you have to have a system of managing all those different wallet addresses. I personally have a lot of nightmares trying to figure out which wallet address has what. Um, so uh, over time, um, you know, it's just a, or it's a factor of time and it becomes essentially unmanageable um, over a long period of time across all the different wallet addresses. And so I don't think that's a very sustainable solution. Um, the other camp of trade-offs that people make when um, trying to proxy for on-chain privacy is um, they mix the assets through a centralized exchange. Um, in which case, you know, you, you will be uh, protecting your identity in some manner on-chain, but off-chain, um, this information obviously goes to the exchange, it goes to the analytics tools that the exchange uses, um, it goes to the uh, other client that the analytics tools have, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's not really a pure form of privacy. You're just kind of shifting the uh, viewability from uh, the entire internet to a select group of you know, centralized entities. Um, and so, you know, uh, what are some good practices? Not to fill a Mantha network, but, uh, you know, <laughs> if you do use... If you do use Manta Network, you know, we have a private payment system, we have uh, private SBTs. And so if you're trying to do payments, you're trying to hold NFTs, you're trying to, uh, you know, uh, collect components of your identity using SBTs, um, it, it can all be done through Manta Network and you don't have to use multiple wallet addresses. You can just use one CK address that uh, holds all of your identities, holds all of your transactions. Uh, there's proofs of those transactions without revealing anything on chain. You don't have to worry about going through uh, centralized exchanges or anything. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's my answer. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, and Dima, we're sort of running out of time, but if uh, some la last uh, thoughts on this, on the trade off. Yeah, I'll try to be time. like uh, super quick. Uh, uh, yeah. I think uh, we're like missing on the, uh, the powers that be. Basically, like uh, we should fight uh, all this pressure from the regulators and like. Uh, uh, protect our non-KYC rights, so then basically it is impossible to track the actual address to the real world identity, like real person. Um, yeah, but I think it's like more of a general remark about the privacy, uh, which is kind of uh, like a bit scares myself. Uh, yeah, that's basically yeah, my like this dimension that we should always think about. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is a very interesting panel. Um, so, and I think, uh, Funky, if you want to uh, bring it up to the, the next uh, panel, this has been great. Thanks, everyone.